company or group that does internal data gathering, so a business intelligence group. And recently, I've been working on optimizing costs, so changing our architecture and our product to fit better cloudy things, and finding opportunities in AWS cloud to save some money. And that's what I'm really going to talk about here today. Uh, I'm going to frame it with two examples of different types of load that play out very differently for how we see <coughs> My hope is that you'll be able to identify with one or the other. Uh, I'm going to give an intro to Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, which is what AWS calls their servers. We're going to talk about the old hosting mindset, where if you need 100 servers on your worst day of the year, you have 100 servers on every day of the year, versus the more cloud concept of elasticity and scaling on demand. I'm then going to do the reverse and say when in the cloud you actually want to lock in anywhere called reservations. We're going to talk about getting creative with licensing while still making sure we're following all sorts of you know, laws and things, uh, but still saving some money there. We're talking about one that I have a lot of fun with, which is the spot market. That's where you can buy unused capacity and discount rates. Cool. I'm going to go over a summary of the stuff I did. I'm also going to go over a summary of stuff I didn't do, because I can only get to so much in this presentation. And I'm really focusing on servers right now. So let's talk about our cast of characters, different people that we're going to look at. And our first person is Bethany. Bethany comes from a family of bakers. See what I did there? Uh, our CEO was John Baker. Uh, they were in a large <coughs> online education company. This is about a year of usage from August 1st to August 1st. And we see particular artifacts of this kind of flow. So we get in the middle, this is December, August is the fall term, a little break in the winter our winter term, and then the summer months. And that's about what a usual online education company would see in their usage. This is exactly what a online education company would see in their usage. Uh, weekends are low. Interestingly, Thursday nights are about our weekend, and Sunday nights are our weekday. Um, how many people deal with a cyclic load that kind of looks like this? If you're from b 2 you are obligated to put your hand up. We're also going to deal with Naomi. Naomi runs a large football company, and they do real-time stats. So this one is very spiky usage. Uh, this is actual viewership numbers from the 2015 NFL season. Uh, I found it interesting. All our usage is on Thursdays, Sundays, and Mondays, with one Saturday in there. Uh, there's a big spike on US Thanksgiving because there are so many games, and I just added all the numbers together. Uh, we see a dip in the wild card round, so nobody likes wild cards. Uh, we see growing spikes in the playoffs, and then a little break before the Super Bowl. We've got zero usage of non-game events. So this is very interesting as a complement to their cyclic usage, because we see both high spikes and actual zero usage where we don't need any. How many people have a usage they associate with that looks like this, very spiky? All right. Too bad, I'm still going to talk. <laughs> it's in the first It's too late. Uh, so we're going to pretend that both of those use 100 servers on their worst day. That's for simplicity. It means we can multiply things by 100. If we have a different size of load, it might not surprise you that I deal with significantly more servers than 100 on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's a good ratio to use. And we're going to provision to P. And what that means is, on our worst day, every day. And this is a traditional hosted mindset, because you're actually purchasing hardware. There's no particular savings to turning it off with <coughs> So every day is like our worst day for our costs. So what will we buy? Oh, and my first call out, AWS calls servers instances, so from now on I'm going to call them instances. So we're going to start with a C4 large. I'm not telling you what that is yet. I live in a couple slides. I want to build to it. Also, AWS actually bills hourly. Google bills by the minute. It reminds me of the old cell phone fights over per minute billing versus per second billing. AWS is the mean one in this case. Um, not only do they build hourly, but if you turn off and turn on an instance, it'll charge you again for that hour. This is something that we discovered in an unfortunate way because we had rapid off-ons in, in some of our dev cycles. And sure enough, if we turn it off and on 17 times in an hour, we just pay for 17 hours. <laughs> First lesson for you. When you turn it off and turn it on again, it's not a software move like restarting a server. That's going and stopping the instance and starting again. You are paying for the hour. Despite that, we're actually not going to go beneath daily here, just for simplicity. I'll deal with that at the end. Basically, everything we're talking about is only even better if you went down to hourly, but I'm already going to go through all the calculations for daily, and I didn't want to get too complicated. 
So what's that going to cost? Well, a C4 large, 19.2 cents an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, $168,192. That's 100 servers for one year. That's a lot. What can we do about that? Well, first let me tell you what a C4 large is. Um, how many people use AWS at all in their day-to-day -day life? D2 others, once again, I've mentioned you are obligated to put your hand up because we <laughs> And it makes me feel better. Any other cloud vendors that you use? Google, Azure, Azure, Azure. So most of the concepts are similar. Everyone has their own names for stuff. I'm dealing with AWS because they're the names I'm most familiar with. Our families, this is my family. Deceptive photo. My son there is crying. Was not happy the entire time, but we managed one of the photos to look like he's smiling, so I'm using it. <laughs> um, M4, C4, R3, R4, X1, P2. It sounds like a bingo game, but it's not a bingo game. The different letters to know different families, which is what AWS calls these groupings. And every time they iterate, every time they release a new version, they just <coughs> find the number. You can still find the old number. So C3 and M3 still exist. They're just unusual because they're over a year old. R4 just came out in November, so we are still actually running a whole bunch of R3. The R4 ends up being a little over twice as powerful for a little less than twice the cost. We just haven't heard it. Um, we actually had an old C1 kicking around for a while, which is interesting. They have different purposes. So the mixed, you can see the ratio of a basic type, two CPUs, eight gigs, about four times as much memory per CPU. The compute intensive one has only twice as much memory as CPU, and the memory intensive one has eight times as much memory as CPU. The other ones have their own things. The actual one has like a terabyte or two terabytes of memory. You're getting the um, first level or second level of that. But we don't really use those. In general, within a family, there's something called a type. So that's, I mentioned C4 large. There's also a C4 X large, which is twice as powerful and twice as costly. There's a C4 2 X large, which is twice as powerful as that and twice as costly as that. That's double impact, where John Hanna Van Dam plays both twins. Either that or Timmy. <laughs> These are all Linux prices. How many people in here use a Linux workload? Most of them. All right. No, I didn't put my hand up that time, and neither did many of the D12 It's because we don't use Windows. Um, turns out it's still about double the cost as you go up tiers, but you're paying a hefty licensing price. And I didn't mention I'll get to that at a certain point. How many people use Windows? D12 right now, I'll get to it. All right. Um, it's still double double. There's actually another type of burst of this. I didn't mention this one before, it's kind of confusing. It's the exact same, the large as the M4. So what's that actually about? Well, there's T2 medium. T2 is the burstable family. It has about the same resources as C4, but one third of the cost. It's 6.5 cents instead of 19.2 cents. <coughs> it's T2 large, compared to the M4 large, it's about the same resources, but half the cost. Just over half the cost. 12.2 cents instead of 20 metric cents. So why would you ever pay more for the same resources? Well, it's because of that word burst. So what does that mean? What it means is you accrue credits and you spend credits. You get a basic amount of CPU that you're entitled to for free. On a teaching medium, you get 40% of one core or 20% of two. But if you need more, you can spend your credits. One CPU at 100% for one minute is one credit, and that scales. Mathematically, you could change any of those numbers. Two CPUs at 50%, so I double from one number and half the other number, is a credit. If I have a different number and double different numbers, so 50% CPU in two minutes, one credit. Two CPUs at 25% for two minutes, one credit. The best ratio here is actually the T2 large, which you don't need to idle <coughs> 3.3 times as often as it's used. T2 medium, you have to idle five times as often. That's because you're accruing 24 credits. 24 times five, 120. Two CPUs, 60 minutes. That's what I mean. Um, the worst ratio is the teaching nano, which is 20 to 1, but you only use that when you're reading the other The other really important thing is that the fourth column, maximum CP credit balance, it's 24 hours. So anything you've accrued, if you're at max, you don't go above 24 hours of storage, of, of stored up credits. So this is the standard picture of CP credit balance. The blue line is how much credit you have. The orange line is how much credit you're using. When one goes up, the other goes down. This is such a standard picture, I had trouble finding any other image to represent this. It's actually from the first blog post four years ago from AWS on introducing personals. So you spend some balance of those. So that seems like a great photo. Let's look at a different one. This is us ramping up our CPU utilization. Our orange line is our CPU. 
and our credit balance going away. So what happens there? Why that strong debt and where we suddenly spend money? Well, it turns out when you spend all your credit and are still going above the base income you're entitled to, you have a 15 minute grace period where your CPU will start to degrade, 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 or degrade. And then, easy words, you're screwed. <laughs> You're screwed because you now have a small percentage of CPU available. You used to be running on two CPUs, running 100% of both, and suddenly you're running 20% of both, and your server doesn't even know. From a CPU point of view, if you're monitoring CPU, and you're all monitoring your CPU and all your boxes, everything looks fine. You're only spending 20% of each board. I'm not spiking out. You are. You just don't know. If you're not monitoring your CPU credit balance, you're screwed. And you're underperforming, and it'll take you a while to figure out why that is. Remember this chart. This is what you're dropping to. So that's your 40%. So that's why not. That's why you wouldn't use bristles. If you're idle enough, it's worth it. If you're not, don't do it. You either have to go up a level of the T2s to gain more credit, or you need to go back to the normal families. Let's talk about the different gotchas. All the T2s start with a certain amount of credit. They all turn out to be 30 minutes of all my CPUs running at 100%. But not really. Only the first hundred per account per region for 24 hours. An account is a, a group of where you're paying. How many people think they spin in their day-to-day -day life more than 100 servers in a day? D12ers, you get to put your hand up. <laughs> you. Running out of credits is really, really bad. You have 15 minutes and then you're just screwed. Credits only store for 24 hours. And if you stop and start an instance, a burst of them, you, you lose any balance you have and you start again with those 30 minutes. And that's actually kind of interesting. Because if you're not spitting more than 100 servers, and you don't run out, and you notice, you can turn off the server and turn it back on again. And now you have a 30 minute buffer. AWS knows this, this is a secret. The way they take, they make sure you're not taking too much advantage of that, because that only works 100 times, and if you need it that often, you probably need something else. Small client story, we put a client on T2s because we thought it would be okay. We monitored CPU, we monitored memory, we monitored disk, we monitored client performance. We did not monitor CPU credits because we didn't know we needed to yet. Sure enough, clients started experiencing degraded performance. <coughs> Investigate, CPU seems fine. Oh, we can reproduce, you know, support 101, I can reproduce the problem, but I don't see the problem on the other side. And eventually we realized we're out of credits. We're at zero credits. Very quickly moved the client up to a better um, set of servers, to C4s, and do an inventory of all our T2s and make sure that we're monitoring CPU credit balance. I want to say that again. Monitor your credit <laughs> balance. It's important. It's really hard to realize what's going on unless you're actually looking at that specific value because your CPU really does look fine. So in our NFL case with Naomi, it's a very spiky usage, remember, we're, we're off most of the week. So how much would we say if we went to T2s? And this is our original calculation, we're at 168 grand. If we drop to T2s, we're paying 6.5 cents instead of 19.2 cents. We're saving $111,000. We're down 56 grand, 57 grand. In house, we use versatiles for client instances that are for testing. So the, the client is using it for their testing. They're trying out a new feature. They want to see a new version of the product. They want to just mess around. It's really good because it's applicable to that spiky case. They're going to go on for a day and hammer it, but then they're not coming back. And that's perfect. We also use it for tooling boxes. So anything that you're scheduling, where you know you're going to run it at night, but not during the day, you're going to run it on weekends, things like that, it's going to be about our updates or our maintenance cycles. Those are great candidates for the burstables because you're idle enough. That doesn't work for Bethany and the online education company. <coughs> we tried it. The client suffered and we fixed it. So if we can't drop the type of server, can we drop the count? Well, yes. Yes, we can. It's almost like I put together this presentation and knew what was coming next. Uh, overall posting, you've got huge turnaround time. So you've got to go through your procurement process. You've got to get approval for your purchase. You've got to wait months for the servers to arrive. You negotiate for the pricing probably before that, maybe after. It depends how you're running it. Um, you have to get it racked and stacked. You have to burn it in. You have to do your testing. And if you're wrong, the cost is very high. Because now the, the MTTR, mean time to resolution, is another six months. Oh, I needed one more server. Yeah, you can't just call up and say, can I have one more server and magically one appears. In the cloud, you kind of can. So that's why you end up provisioning to peak. And just to put that visually, provisioning to peak is like having your number of servers be that orange line when your needs are the blue line. 
It's worse for the NFL. Naomi. Better for Bethany. But still, not great. So what can we do about that? Well, it turns out even for Bethany is pretty bad. This is year, year over year. So this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years of usage by our theoretical online education company. Um, and we can see provision to peak means there's a lot of waste. Waste that looks like this. This is basically your classic view of why cloud is awesome. You're either over or you're under, and you're unhappy in either case. For those green sections, that means that you've over provisioned and you're wasting dollars. You've got servers that you don't need. In those red sections, you made a mistake, and now you're under capacity, which means your performance is worse, or your clients are unhappy. And if you could get that happy cloud case, smooth curves, <coughs> you're going to have your place. This is actually true of the vast majority of things. Anytime you chart your prices and you find it's a step function, you should be sad because it means somewhere there's a, there's a capacity problem. That you're paying for stuff you don't need. I really like stuff. <laughs> That's really what it looks like when you drop a stuff. It's kind of cool. Um, so we want to get elastic. We want to be scaling up and down our feet. But we don't want to manually bring up and down instances all the time. We want to terminate them. And that is actually what AWS calls it. When you turn off an instance, when you delete it, it's called terminating it. Just let me use that. So we have this thing called auto-scaling groups. Uh, details there at that URL. You start with the minimum and the maximum and the amount you actually have, and then you make rules for how to scale up and scale down. So this is what's called a 214. Your desired, which could also be your what I'm actually at. Your minimum, don't go below this. Your maximum, don't go above this. And it can scale up and down. You can have the rules. This is an example of some rules we have on a product that we use that streams video, that is currently streaming this video to the internet. Um, it has a rule that says when you're above 70 megs of network, you should add an instance. When you're below 10, you should drop one. And that's how we can handle whether there are 10 people watching this online or 10,000. If there are 10,000, I have follow-up questions for someone. I think I'm interesting, but not that much. Um, but we can handle that because we set up a scaling group and it will adjust automatically based on the network throughput. You can also set it on a schedule. And say, I know that I have an exam on Friday night, or I know I have a football game on Thursday night, I want you to automatically adjust desire up. That actually brings us to a gotcha. You're not, if you, you can use desire to manually set what you're at. Like, oh, we've got this big event coming up and we forgot about it, let's just quickly set desire to max. You might say, this has happened to us. You could in fact say that this has happened to us. It won't go below that. If you manually go set that to a high value, it won't drop you down again, and you'll end up losing the advantage that you're gaining from scaling. So be very careful with desire. It's kind of the key to how the whole thing works. Your rules are going to make it go up or down, but only within the context of what you're doing. And you can scale on anything. Um, anything you can want to scale on CPU, network, disk, or custom things that you set. So let's see what happens to Naomi in our NFL. So we start with 100 servers, 365 days a year. 36,500 server days. Okay, that's where we get our 876,000 hours, and that's where we got, remember we switched to teaching medium, six and a half cents, that's where we got our 57 grams. But we don't need that much. If we actually just sum the server needs day by day, we only need 1,458 server days, which is, you know, a lot less. We just dropped 57 grams to 2,275 dollars. A good trade just gained a car. Um, that's massive. That's in fact the end of what we'll be hearing from Naomi until the summary. Because uh, once I'm down from $168,000 to $2,000, I feel like taking a break. But let's check in with Bethany and the online education case. Again, this is our unscaled case. We're still at the C4 largest, still at 168 grand. What can we do? Well, things get a bit better. They don't. They don't get as massively different because we're not as spiky in our load. We actually have significant use of homes. We still save about 72 grand. Just, you know, I will accept that. Um, but we're still at 96 grand of what we're paying. We set the minimum here at two because that's the lowest number that's bigger than one. Basically, you don't want anything to be at one because then you're not redundant. But realistically, we're not dropping below 10. 10 is the lowest number there right now. So let's think about that. Our actual minimum is 10. We're never dropping below 10. Can I get a better deal if I guarantee that we'll always be above 10? Well, it turns out, once again, I wrote the presentation. Yes, we can. Something called reservations. 
So the opposite of going elastic, where we're going to turn off and on servers as we need them, what I'm saying we are absolutely going to get inelastic. We know we need these servers. Opposite elastic would be rigid. If you're not from town or not familiar with the university, that's the rigid tool, symbol of engineering. Uh, so let's lock in the servers we already need. There's something called reserve instances. What you're buying is very, very specific coupons. They are dated and timed, so there is a March 20th, 7 p.m. coupon. You cannot use it at 8 p.m. nor at 6 p.m. on March 20th, only at 7 p.m. If you don't use it for anything, it's like you paid money for a thing and then tore it out. It is very specific to a region. That's what AWS calls uh, an area where they're operating. US East is the one we're using. AWS Montreal is different. Region. It is particular to an instance type, so C4 large. It is particular to an OS, Windows versus Linux. It's particular to a tenancy, which we'll deal with a little bit later. And you either are locking right down to a zone. So zone is how AWS handles uh, high availability. In US East, for example, you can be in 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. Quirky fact, my 1A will not be the same as your 1A. Um, or you can lock to the region, but if you lock to the region, you're not guaranteed that you try to spin up an instance, you'll get it. That's a special case. If you spin a lot of servers, that's something you have to care about. If you're not spinning a lot, chances are AWS has more capacity than you need, and you'll be fine. We have to care about that stuff. Most sizes of companies don't. So we're trading in a coupon to not pay for an instance if it matches all my characteristics. If I had a C4 large running Windows on default in US East 1 in the region and I have a coupon for it, I don't pay my 19.2 cents because I've already paid for it. Well, how much have I paid for it? Depends. Uh, there are lots of different models here, one year or three year. I deal mostly with one years. No upfront is advantageous because um, you're not paying anything. You just pay an amount per month, $118.26 a month. The effective rate is then 16.2 cents. No, Amazon's mean with math. They are not helping you with time value of money. It literally took $118.26. Multiply by 12, divide by 5, divide by 24, and you will get 16.2 cents. That kind of annoys me because I know enough about economics to say that's not how you're supposed to do it. Okay. Uh, all up front is dumb. You'll note the difference in savings between giving them $650 and giving them $1,200 is at 1%. Put your money in bank. GIC, stocks, I don't, know. don't do full upfront. We do partial upfront, it's the nice balance. If you have the cash flow to do it, it's advantageous. Also, if you have the threshold rate, so often when companies are investing, they want to make sure they're getting a decent return on their money. So you're saying I'm going to lock up $650 for an additional 7%, make sure the company's okay with that. Um, the only reason I can think that you do all up front is if you're in a weird cash accounting scenario where you want your expenses to appear at the beginning of the year, but I don't like that, so I ignore it. So what does that look like? Well, before, remember, we had our 20,841 days. Let's lock in those 10. We never drop below them. So now we have our reserved rates, and we have our on-demand rates. I didn't explicitly call it before, but that amount where you pay for hourly and you turn it off, you stop paying for it. AWS calls that on-demand. Sometimes I'll call it OB, and I'll call it reserved instances RI. If I'm running out of space, uh, we lock in our two different rates and we save some money. So we're locking in the 10 and then we're taking those 10 away from the on demand days. How much money do we save? Four grand. Decent amount, but not ideal. Turns out 10 isn't actually the right number to lock. You don't want to lock just your minimum or your trough. As long as your server count is higher than the amount you lock in often enough, it's worth it to have some days where you throw away your coupons because there are other days where you don't. So we're gonna look at how I did this analysis, and then after that, we're gonna look at the right way to do this analysis. So how do I do it? Well, I'm a SQL ninja and an Excel ninja, so I generally turn to one of those two tools. In this case, I turn to Excel. I made 365 rows, one for each day of the year, and put the server needs in the rows. I made 100 columns, one for zero to 100, I guess that's 101 columns, um, representing the number of reservations to purchase, and then in each cell, I did the column header times 24 hours a day times the reserved rate, 14.8 cents, plus either row header minus column header or zero, whichever is bigger, so I don't want to subtract, I'm paying for them whether I use them or not, times the on demand rate. Then I sum all the columns and find the lowest value, and I get this. By the way, I did this on a much, much more complicated set of data than 100 servers. Excel can have a lot of columns, and I used all of them. I ran out. I had log five. 
but it's kind of cool, and I was really proud of it. Like, look at the, <laughs> but it's 36 is the right number, and it was this massive spreadsheet that just all these numbers that you can't possibly read, they just, your eyes blur. And I showed my wife. <laughs> my wife who lectures at the University of Waterloo in statistics and actuarial science, my wife who is much smarter than me. Look, honey, look what I did, because this is what pillow talk is when you're married to a statistician. <laughs> look, honey, look what I did. And she said, that's dumb. Oh, yeah, I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know you could have just used a formula. Like, I could have enforced it. Why do I need a formula? That's why I don't have to remember formulas. I would force things. She teaches formulas. She says, yeah. Why didn't you just use percentiles? I was like, well, what if I Google more images of an injury? Will that help us? So let's look at how you should do this. Remember our savings of 23%? Turns out that number's really important. We're, we're, what we're looking for is the number at which the value of which 23% of the days require server count less than. This is percent count. We're going to stop for a math lesson. It's a measurement of statistics. She teaches statistics. I should have known. Um, the value of which that percent of your values are found beneath it. In Excel, it'll do it for you. There's a formula called percentile.exe for exclusion, exclusive. So you can't have a zeroth percentile because you can't have a value in the set that is lower than all the values in your set. You can't have a hundredth percentile because you can't have a value that's in your set that's higher than all values in your set. Note that Excel will let you do ink or inclusive. Um, so your lowest value will get zero and your highest value will get zero. There, there will get hundred. There are a couple reasons not to do that. Most importantly, you'll be dead to me. Um, that's not how percentiles work. Stop abusing that. Excel only fixed this in 2007. So I'm willing to give them a partial yay because they fixed it, but a slight boo because for years a spreadsheet will let you have a zeroth percentile. And that's not how percentiles work. Maybe I get there about that. Alright, so let's go back to reserve. Let's see how much going up to 36 will save us. So it turns out instead of saving 10, we we'll save 36. And we pay 14.8 cents on the 36, 19.2 on the rest. The red line is 10, the yellow line is 36. And you can see that most of our days are above it. You might say that 77% of our days are above it, because 20 percent are below it. And we save another 57 percent which is good, we like saving money. We end up losing some of that because we've got some servers that are just, we're paying for them but not using them. But we'll deal with that in just a little bit. So what else can you do with our eyes? Um, remember this where we talk about all the requirements? You can actually modify between them. So you can say, I used to be locked to US East 1A and have a capacity guarantee, but I want to switch to just being locked to US East 1 and lose my capacity guarantee. You can put a modification in, there's an API for that. Um, if you're with Linux, you can change the type within a family. So you can turn one large into two mediums, or two mediums into one large, or the double the cost, double the amount. You can mess with that, but you can't do that in Windows because of licensing. Um, you can't change the other things. So you can't change families from C4 to M4. You can't change zones from USCs to C4, things like that, unless you do something really wacky, which we'll get to. But what if you're wrong? Right? You just locked into a one-year contract. So I have good news and bad news. The thing that made me feel much better about locking in is there's a marketplace. You can go there and sell your unused reserves. So let's say there's three months left on your contract. It's like, it's like you're subleasing your car. There's three months left on your contract, you realize you're switching versions, you're messing with the product and maybe you don't need that anymore. You can totally sell it on the marketplace. That's the good news. The bad news is it's barren. Um, I had so much trouble finding one that I reached out to our rep city of the US for them to help me because I thought I was encountering a UI bug where I couldn't search for it. They found one, a very specific one. This is an i2 4x large Linux in North Virginia that's available for two months, or at least it was yesterday. I asked. Um, and this is what it looks like. The problem is the market's hyper uh, And there's a pretty good write up of, that, of what that means if, if you geek out over economics, read that. Um, Basically, because you have to be specific to your type, to your region, to your OS, the market gets so segmented that there isn't enough people involved to really keep a, a vibrant market. It's, it's kind of like finding water. Okay. Um, what else can you do? You can get converted. That has nothing to do with it, it's just a very pretty one. Um, so they're always three years, and they have less savings than a normal three years. So remember this slide, I actually scrolled down now, that four feet. Um, we got 23% with our partial one year up front. That would be 38% if we logged in for three years instead of one year. But it would only be 27% if it was converted. What does convertible get you? Um, 
You want to log in and get the good rate, but you're not sure about more things. So you can actually change from a C4 to a C5 if they come out with it, or an M4. You can do anything that will cost you more money. It was very nice to you that way. It will allow you to just give them more money. You, you upgrade and you just pay the difference. And that's pretty good, because in three years is an, is an excessive amount of time in cloud speed. We haven't taken advantage of that in enough, so we go with the one years and just deal with the fact that things change enough. Um, but if you are more confident in what your usage is going to be longer out, that can be a pretty advantageous way. And the convertibles give you a little bit of confidence, like you're trading some of your savings for some easier savings, for some easier conversions later. So what else can we do? Well, we talked a lot about Windows licensing. These are all Windows pricing. Can we do something clever there? Yes. Um, dedicated hosts. So dedicated hosts are this idea that instead of paying for the virtual machine, instance itself, I want to play for the host and figure out how many I can run on that host. This is from the dedicated host page on AWS. What you end up with is a family. So on C4, two sockets, 20 cores. I can spin 16 C4 larges on that box, or eight X larges, or four two X larges, you'll know. It's getting in half, that's because double power double cost. You can't mix. So I can't run like eight larges and four X larges. Once I take a dedicated host, say you are C4 large, it is a C4 large, and I can run 0 or 16 or any number in between, I'm paying for it all regardless. With licensing, it's similar. You're either paying for the virtual license that's sitting on the OS itself, or you're paying for the host. You effectively pay Linux rates to AWS, because instead of paying Microsoft licensing, AWS is clearly given to Microsoft, and they're not friends. Uh, you pay directly Microsoft for licensing, directly for AWS for the servers, and you save some money. How valuable this is depends on what kind of deal you can get. So we're going to focus on the C4s. The only way to calculate this fully is to know what your volume licensing rate is. I'm not going to tell you ours, because that's not a thing I can tell you. <laughs> How many people think their company has a volume license rate with Microsoft? Probably a negotiated detail. <coughs> yeah, right. So because I'm not going to tell you ours, we're going to use their public pricing. And we're going to do some fudgy hand weaving because it's not quite perfect, but you'll see how awesome it is. So that's our current pricing. First thing to note, it's for 16 cores, and the C4 has 20 cores. Well, that's fine. Uh, we need 20 cores. So let's hand wave and say divide by 16 times 20, now we have 20 core rate. 25% more. That's not actually how it works, but it's close enough to how it works, and it will be over there. What else? Uh, we need a cow. So that's a client access license. You go again to a different Microsoft site. Now, $219 for five users. Great, let's add that. So now we're at $7,912.75. Uh, what? Huh, interesting point. Units, really, really important. Microsoft runs what's called the 5 plus 5 model. They're changing the name. If you care, long term search and right? Which means technically you could run that server for 10 years on that. But I find it extremely unlikely that in 2027 we're going to be running Windows Server 2016. At least if we follow up So let's say we're going to use three years, three years as our amortization rate. So we're going to say, let's pretend we use that for three years, and at the end of three years it's worth nothing. Divide by three years, divide by 365 days a year, ignore leap years. It hurt me on the inside to do so, but it just makes things simpler. Divide by 24 hours a day, you get 31 cents an hour. Seems reasonable. All right, so let's add that to our dedicated host rate. So on demand, we're paying buck seventy-five an hour. We're adding thirty cents, two dollars and fifty-one cents an hour. If we went with one-year partial, we'd be at buck point three six one an hour. What were we getting before? Uh, that's maybe nineteen point two cents and fourteen point eight cents. That's quite a bit more expensive. What did we miss? Anybody spot it? All right. We get 16 of them for that price, not one. Because we can put 16 C4 larges on one dedicated host. So when we divide by 16, the numbers get a lot better. 12.8 cents as opposed to 19.2 on demand. Uh, 8.5 cents as opposed to 14.8 cents for reserve. But there's a catch. It's not like if we turn off the server, we stop paying the licenses. Remember, we paid for a lifetime license and amortized it over three years. So we're cheating to say we can use that for on demand. So let's just use that for our things we were already willing to lock. Or reserved instances. And 
because it, it becomes chunky, remember I told you it should be sad when you're a step function, this is a step function, there's 16 at a time, you want to be careful about buying at least two, so I can put one in each availability zone, so I'm still redundant, and I can't buy 36, because 36 doesn't divide by 16, I can buy 32 though. So let's do that, where did we leave off? This is where we were last with Bethany, the online education space, we had Uli on min, RI preserved, we were running 36 of those. So instead, let's run four of those, 36 minus 32, over on 3,200 dedicated posts. We saved another 17 grand because we changed who we pay the Microsoft licensing to. That's pretty substantial. This number gets bigger if you're dealing with SQL Server. How many people use SQL Server in their day-to-day -day lives? Right. SQL Server is really, really expensive. Dedicated hosts can make it a little better because you're able to bring your own license with Microsoft. And if it's Microsoft, not friends. Better to pay them each separately and keep them on different tables of money. So that's the end of easily calculable savings that we can get for Bethany. But there's one more item that I really want to touch on, which is spot instances. Uh, when you know you can finish in under two minutes. I'll explain that in a second. So the spot is, as much as we love the cloud because we can now provision to need as opposed to provision to P, AWS still has to have enough physical servers to host everyone. The common joke is the cloud just means it's someone else's computer. It's their computer. They have to be running servers somewhere to host all this. So they sell off their excess capacity in a market. A market that's also hyper-segmented, just like the RI market, but because Amazon backs it with themselves, it's fluid enough um, to do cool stuff. So a C4 large, as of yesterday night, when I pulled this number, was 9.91 cents. Remember, that's compared to 19.2 cents on demand, even 14.8 cents for I'm willing to log in for a year. So that's pretty amazing. What's the catch? The catch is, if the price ever goes above your bid, so you set a bid what you're willing to pay, whatever they're selling for, you pay below that. You have two minutes. You get a notification through CloudWatch, which is AWS notification system. And two minutes later, your instance is gone. So depending on your workload, maybe that's fine. Or maybe you're screwed. Um, you really need to be ephemeral. So queue-based work, where you're serving something and you're, already, you're always dealing with it in under two minutes. Or traditional distributed computing, Traditional distributed computing, you want to break the problem into really small pieces, and as you finish a piece, you have meaningful progress. So if you lose, say, I'm going to be destroyed after two minutes, and you die in the middle of the calculation, you're totally fine with that, because you should redo that calculation. In a lot of distributed computing models, you can handle that. If you can't handle that, don't use this, unless you can do defined durations. There's another way that spot works, which is called defined duration. You could buy an hour or six hours. So this is like the, the love child between on-demand and reserved, when you're willing to commit not quite for a year, but at least six hours we're going to be together. Um, it's a very strange hotel analogy there that I'm going to work with. So why didn't I use it in the example? Because it's a fluid rate. It's 9.91 cents today, but tomorrow it might be something else. In fact, it updates every five minutes. Um, AWS drives a lot of that market need, but, but any use of your rate is affecting. Also, how do you even handle that? Like, I need 10 servers. What if the rate goes above my spot and I just screw because I no longer have 10 servers? So assume you're ephemeral um, and assume you can handle all this. What would you do? Well, introducing our friendly elastic load balancer, which is a traditional load balancer, but it points to two auto-scaling groups. One that's spot and one that's on-demand. You set your spot max price for the on-demand price. You're always happier to buy spot if it's cheaper. And you make sure that spot scales up before on-demand would scale up, and on-demand scales down before spot would scale down. You can do that with a couple different ways. You can either literally set your rates such that 20% you know, CPU, it'll scale up, but it won't scale up until 30%. Or you can do crazier things with alerts, um, using CloudWatch to send notifications and, and doing some complicated things that I'm not really getting into here. But you can set it up that one makes the other change its desire. So when, one, when your spot rate goes up and you lose an instance, you trigger one new instance to happen on the AWS side. It's, it's a crazy human trick that I'm going to do now. It's the equivalent of this. It's that, but in computing and in the clouds. So how worth it is it? If you can handle two minute shutdowns, which Bethany cannot. And if the price never moves, which it does, we would save another 19. So it is worth looking into the problem is I don't quite feel the data integrity to show you this and say, we will save 19 grand here, because it's weird. Um, 
remember I mentioned the hypersegmentation. There's something you can do to make that a little bit better. If you use containers, you can reduce the segmentation. The idea of containers here is I'm going to bid not just on my C4 large, but I'm going to bid twice as much on my C4X large and twice as much of that on my C4X2X large. And if I get a 2X large, I'm going to launch four containers on it. If I get an X large, I'm going to launch two containers. If I get a large, I'm just going to launch one container. If I can send twice as much load to a server that's twice as powerful, I have twice as much of a market. And that can be really powerful when you're in a segmented marketplace. Again, you still need to be ephemeral. You still need to be able to handle the two-minute shutdown or your defined duration. But it can be super advantageous and you can save a lot of money. So how much money have we saved? Let's talk about it. Recall Bethany, our online education doctor. So very cyclic load, decent minimums. We start with 100 C4 larges every day of the year. We paid 168 grand. Provisioning to need. Dropping from provisioning to peak to provisioning to need using an auto scaling group, we saved 72 grand, 42.9% of our original cost. Reduced our number of server days. We then locked in 10 servers for reserved rates, one year commitment rates. We saved another 2.3%. We then realized we were wrong about the number 10 and upped it to 36. This is not about troughs, it's about percentiles. We saved another 3.4%. And then we got funky with licensing and dedicated hosts and saved another 10.5%. All in all, we trimmed $100,000 from our year cost of 100 servers. So you can imagine in your head if you were scaling that to 1,000 servers or 10,000 servers, that's saving more money. 59% in all, which is pretty impressive. Not as impressive as Naomi. This Naomi runs a football company. Very, very spiky load. We start provisioning the peak again, same 168 range. We drop from C4s to T2s. Remember, we're burstable because we are idle enough that we don't expend all of our credit when we need it. We already saved 66.1% off the top. We then take further advantage of our spikiness by going to the ASGs, on the scale group, dropping our server days, saving another 32.5%. Dropping from 168 grand to 2,000 dollars, 98.6 percent of our aggregate costs. That is absolutely insane, and also the reason you go to the cloud. One of them. Let's talk about some things we didn't do. Um, I didn't mention storage. The C4 learns in the teaching unit actually come with no disk. There is not much you can do with a server that has no disk. <laughs> um, I didn't cost talk about it because it's 10 cents a gig a month. So on, on our internals, we have 40 gig disks. It's four bucks a month. It only makes things slightly better by four dollars a month whenever you're turning off a server. There are some instance families with this. It's the old versions of the, the C's have it, the C3s, and a bunch of others. They're super fast, they're SSDs. They're purely ephemeral. When you stop and then start an instance again, that disk is white, maybe. You sometimes actually get it back, but you're not guaranteed to get it back. So it's kind of cool for some user use if you're running um, backups. You can back up to that before you toss it off to another location but you don't use it for main things. So we ignored EBS or elastic block storage because it doesn't make as much difference. Um, I would warn you, when you turn off a server, there's a button you can press that'll cause your disk to stick around. That sounds like a good thing if you need it, and a bad thing if you forget about it and then find it a month later because you've got some disk running there that's just costing you money for no reason. Not that that's happening. <laughs> it's happening. Um, in general, don't sell for all. If AWS has a service for it, it's probably better than what you can do. Um, I joke that, D21, I don't joke, this is our actual mission statement. D21 is the business of transforming the way the world learns, not rolling DNS, not implementing Elastic Cache. We transform education. So if we can have somebody else who is in the business, AWS absolutely is in the business of making DNS work and rolling Elastic Cache server, it's going to be more affordable to do that. I talk about that a whole lot at a presentation that you can find on YouTube uh, at the last. AWS user conference, re-event 2016, how busting the myth of vendor lock-in, how D12 embraced the lock and opened the cage. True story, I read that as the title of my own talk and said, who wrote that? And then I looked through old emails and found out it was me. <laughs> um, apparently I got flowery when we were proposing things, and, and that was how. I also, in the description, had a pregnancy metaphor about native cloud births. <laughs> but that's best left just as reference and not explaining. Um, so it is important, and, and the summary of that talk, if you don't want to watch it, is is three three words: run the numbers. The idea of locking in is I'm afraid I'm going to do a one-year commitment. 
run numbers. There's some amount of time where it was a good trade and some amount of time where it's not. As long as you don't change your mind in a certain amount of time, it was a good trade. And you'll know what I did this whole time was rub the numbers. We didn't convert to teaching media for Bethany because it wasn't working. She's not idle enough. That load isn't idle enough. Uh, there are a couple places where you're not going to use Amazon services, where you're going to sell them. Dedicated the hosts were a great example of that. Because of the quirkiness of paying Amazon to pay Microsoft, it's actually worth it to roll your own licensing, paying Microsoft directly. There's another case where the way AWS says email is weird. Um, you probably don't want to pay $2 per 1,000 emails, which is what their rates are. I don't know why those rates are like that, but run the numbers. But chances are very high Amazon's going to do it better than you because it's what they do. What were some assumptions we made that are just false? We assumed all pricing is US East, which is in North Virginia. Um, it's not. We run regions all over the world. The other regions are within 10 to 20 percent, and they tend to scale in similar ways. You're just things are more expensive when you're running in Sydney or Singapore than when you're running in North Virginia. Uh, we use daily modifications, not hourly. That only makes the stuff we did better. So when you run hourly and you're running an auto scaling group, you can turn more stuff off more often. But it made my examples too complicated, so I pretended it wasn't a thing. The last one's a doozy. Past performance is indicative of future needs. No, it's not. No, never. Stop. Statisticians are crying right now. Um, that actually makes the cloud better. So we looked at a past year, 2016 or 2015 for the NFL case, and said, what if that plays out next year? What should we do? That's not actually what you get to do unless you're in a very strange industry. But the whole point of the cloud is that it's making your mistakes less costly. If you're wrong, and it turns out you need 110 servers instead of 100 servers, you press a button. If it turns out that the NFL case takes off and they start running games on other days, they you know add the CFL for some reason, um, that's okay. If we need to change from T2s back to C4s, that's literally a drop down. You can just click, click I think the server reboots, so it's a slight outage, but like click, click, now I'm on a different time. When I'm provisioning in a hosted environment where I'm procuring, racking, and stacking, the cost of being wrong is immense. And let's let's be clear about something. Everyone in this room, everyone in the world, me, us, all of us, we will be wrong some of the time. Do risk mitigation. Do planning, do models, figure it out. But you're gonna be wrong. So one of the ways to mitigate risk of being wrong is evaluating the cost of fixing it. One of my favorite parts, I'm a pessimist by nature, one of my favorite parts about the cloud is that when I'm wrong, I click a button and now I'm right again. And you can do that in a very iterative fashion. You design a model to monitor your pricing, you look at your capacity, you find out you're spending more or less, and then you rerun the numbers and figure out what went wrong. You either fix your model or fix reality, depending on what went wrong. Sometimes you set an auto scaling to a large number that you should things like that. But we can spin down servers and stop paying for them. So that is about what I've got. Are there any questions? But before I do that, I have to tell you, you're gonna have to use the mic or make me repeat your questions, and I don't like repeating questions. So you use the mic. Does Do you have any questions about the variety of stuff I just Hello. Does uh, Azure provide uh, the same features? Yeah, say it again in the mic. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, Microsoft Azure provide uh, some competitive feature like this? Um, some. So as it turns out, Microsoft Azure licensing for Microsoft uh, is much better than AWS's licensing for Microsoft. So for dedicated hosts, the equivalent wouldn't exist, but you're already paying great rates. Microsoft, but the idea of locking in and paying less, and the idea of some of the services do exist. Uh, I know what they're called in Google Cloud. Google Cloud calls it committed use discount, is the equivalent of group reservations. It works slightly differently. Um, the analogy I often give is, if you really, really understand your load, AWS will end up being better for you. If you're not sure, and you just want to figure it out as you go, Google will end up being better from a pure costing point. Azure will be better if you're running pure Microsoft. The reason D12 picked AWS, we did dedicate that we're not splitting that, we're not going to also do also Azure. Um, AWS is fanatic about the cloud. That's kind of what they do. They, I mean, Amazon is more than that, but AWS is really a focused organization that's ahead of the curve and relentlessly improving. Whereas Google Cloud, some of the stuff, if you're only doing big data, go to Google Cloud. It, other than that, they're still at table stakes. They haven't really invested as much. And Microsoft Azure 
if you're all Microsoft, it's going to be better. But if you have any sort of mixed load, they're just not dealing with it as well. They're kind of, it's weird to call Microsoft a new guy, but they really are the new guy in this space. Um, but most of the things have equivalents and you can find them. I don't know what the right terminology is, but they all exist. And I've done some of the pricing between them. For basic servers, it's table stakes. They all have kind of the idea of a reservation, and the idea of scaling because we're in the cloud. For some of the subservices, so like can Azure run a Redis cluster? I'm not sure. What else you got? <coughs> I used to think about bursting helmet. So if you have 24 hours of the maximum number of credits, and how long can you run it for? Um, so it depends on your number of CPUs, but let's see, 576. By by two, by by sixty. Four and a half hours. So it's in, on a teaching meeting, it'll depend. So it's it's twenty four hours of accruing credits you can save up, not spending them. So it depends on your idle to usage ratio. Uh, so with the T two large, which is three point three three, that means it's going to be just under eight hours. When you store up twenty four, you can be at eight hours one hundred percent. At the five times rate, which is a teaching medium. You can be at 24 to 5 by 5, so 5, 4.75. Math is hard. Um, so it depends on your level because your number of CPUs changes. What else you got? I have another question. Wait for the microphone. I remember because sometimes I watch people capture and came here. So yeah, I was following uh, Azure development on. Microsoft is uh, claiming that uh, they are competitive from price point of view. So if, if you go with this uh, AWS pricing scheme to Microsoft, uh, if it's not a technical issue, they cannot match it? I'm gonna tell a little story and then I'll answer the question. I walked into a Best Buy looking for a product and the salesperson actually told me to go down to another store and buy it there. And it was like the weirdest sales experience I'd ever had. A salesperson told me to go to another store. Listen to the, like understand the goals of the person selling you a thing. Their goals are often not the same as your goals. Obviously. If somebody telling me go somewhere else, I'm so much more likely to believe when they say put this part you should buy here than anything else. When Microsoft is going to put out a press release, of course they're going to say they're a price competitive. Google just came out with a thing that, that says they're, they just iterated on um, committed use discounts, and now they're 80% you know, better than AWS. And to their credit, they did they showed they were very transparent in what they said. Uh, but when you look at it, it was like, all right, so this assumption is false, and this assumption is false, and I guess I see how this niche part would be. I don't know if Microsoft's fully competitive across the board. I know that they're better if you're a pure uh, Windows play for servers. On the other stuff, I'd have to do the math. Run the numbers. Like, it's too hard to make a generic case, thou shalt always use AWS in every context, or thou shalt use Microsoft in every context. Run the numbers for yourself. If you don't have somebody like me who you know likes to talk to their wife about what they did in a spreadsheet, or, or husband or friend or whatever, like find someone like me to run numbers. It's there are too many quirks that are going to be tailored to your story. I have a colleague uh, who's amazingly talented and doesn't think he is. It's very frustrating to deal with because I'm, I think I'm amazingly talented. Whether I am or not is a different question. Um, but he says he never wants to tell a story of this is what you should do. <coughs> he always wants to tell a story of this is what I did. And it worked for me. Is it going to work for you? I don't know. I'm not you. <laughs> Figure it out. So. In all of these, please don't ever do something we tell you to do because we said it. Like, figure out if it makes sense to you. Some of them will, some of them won't. I've tried to construct this in a way where I'm at least giving two different frameworks of why this was advantageous to this kind of load versus that kind of load. And here is a bunch of stuff that worked for us. It's also a process, right? Like, I certainly hope that next month we are more cost efficient than this month. Otherwise, I'm probably bored. And he has follow up questions. Um, but, Make sure that it's right for you. Never believe what a salesperson tells you. Because I, I, except ours, All right, I'm rambling. Another question. You don't have that question. Just eat more food and drink more beer. All right. Oh, ah, that's right.
Thank you. <laughs> With food and beer. <laughs> so over the years, how has your uh, pricing changed in terms of, uh, you know, with AWS pricing uh, going down, uh, how, how has that affected your actual cost? Because, you know, your, your needs might go up because there's more things, bells and whistles that you take advantage of. Um, Amazon likes us a lot. <laughs> we pay them more money each year than your previous right now. Um, I, I had a joke project called the Tesla Fund, uh, which is, it's hard to talk, like, Sometimes I talk about you know saving twenty grand or fifty grand, and then I go home and like budget for my family, and the difference of what's important to my family budget, what's important to D2L Corporation's budget is significantly different. And I feel like a really weird person when I say that's only a hundred thousand dollars; it's not worth the effort. And then I like, Bit, what have I become? Oh my God. <laughs> um, so we we start talking about things in terms of Tesla. So how many Teslas a month could we buy? Can we save on Tesla a month? So we have very strict rules. Karma works. So I mean, like I like gamification of systems game-based learning, education system that we are working on. Funds are fun. Um, and it was fun. Like, we say, <coughs> right here, add it to the Tesla meter. Have we hit one Tesla? We hit a Tesla. We get a Lego brick. We do Lego bricks at D12 for, for homes, friends. So we have saved multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars a month through product changes, uh, where because we can now take advantage of AWS tools in ways where we used to be self-rolling, things can be very advantageous. Finding servers that we don't need, that's called the right sizing is sometimes the term. If you're running a C4 4X and you only need a C4X, you're paying four times the cost. I'm running my CPU and it never goes above 20%. I'm like, yeah, drop the level. If you can, if you can handle an average and things like that. Um, the drop in pricing, AWS every year drops something. Um, Google does as well, Azure does as well. They're all driving down the cost of things. And then they release new stuff that's more expensive and more powerful. It is a happy, sad day for me. It's happy because my job is to save the company money, and we do. When that happens, I get to do that. It's a sad day because all my freaking spreadsheets have to be updated. Because <laughs> um, I haven't fully automated all those. This only happens once a year. It's not really worth it. I ran the numbers. There's an XKCP chart of like how often something has to happen and how much investment you have to do to automate it. It's not worth investing. Um, so yeah, we've saved a significant amount of money. Because of client growth, we're moving more and more clients into AWS Cloud as opposed to our own hosting environments. We are spending more and more money every month, every year. Um, actually, I'll meet them tomorrow where I'll discuss our budget. And the credit programs, too. And, and credit programs. There are a lot of tools that AWS will offer you. It's in their best interest for you to put more stuff in their things. One of the interesting things, another thing, we talk about data transfer costs. There's a cost for transferring data, but only out. <laughs> AWS never charges you for sending data into AWS, only for ever taking it out. And why is that? Again, understand the motivations of the person selling you a thing. It's because they want you to put your data there. Okay, fine, I get it. Um, so take that into account. So yeah, we they like us. They we certainly are giving them large sums of money um, and more and more cheers. The, the other thing I didn't deal with at all is um, if we wanted to go to a new region to stand up your own hosting environment, there's kind of a base minimum footprint, half a million, million dollars before you're actually gonna get to a new region. In AWS, that number is much, much smaller. It depends on your own needs. You know, we run more than just a web tier database tier, file tier, monitoring, tooling, things like that. Um, but when we can go into a new region, because two clients are there that are interesting, as opposed to having to wait until we have 20 or 50 to make it profitable, that's awesome. And if it doesn't work, we can shut it down. Now, we luckily haven't had that problem, but the idea of that global expansion where AWS is going to pay to already have this infrastructure worldwide, and we're very excited when they open Canada, because um, it turns out we are here, some clients here too who would prefer their data not go to certain other countries. Um, you can kind of piggyback on that investment. So yes, we're paying more and more, but we're also doing more and more. I mean, we're able to do some cool things. My one of my visions is, is right now we couldn't really sell to one user. If one person wanted to open a course, it's not financially viable for us to do that. Our product isn't designed that way. But as we convert our product to take more and more advantage of cloud elasticity really small footprints and scaling on a curve instead of a step function could eventually become a totally reasonable business proposition, right? I think that's kind of cool. Whether it's a thing or not, I don't know. I haven't actually told anyone in sales about that. But <laughs> if they watch the presentation, they'll find out that's my dream. What else? I saw there's another one here. Yeah, you can like, there's so many balls. 
Um, yeah, I was just curious uh, in terms of uh, DR strategies in regards to costs. Um, I know it gets kind of infinitely complex with things like that. So that you know, if you've done any sort of calculations on where that happy point is, between like speed of DR versus uh, you know, cost, that's it. Sure. Um, Netflix does a cool talk every year at reInvent where they evacuate a region and they show it in, in, uh, in animated GIFs. They just shut down the region and watch all their traffic go somewhere else. So the simplest way to do DR is double all your costs. Just run two of everything in different places and occasionally test going from one to the other. It's actually more than double because you have to pay for the transfer fee. Um, and you can do that in AWS. So you could run in multiple regions or multiple zones. What you want to think about is how much am I willing to pay for and how much do I want to get? So you can run the first level of AWS is going to be multi-zone. So I'm running 100 servers, I'm going to put 50 of them in 1A and 50 of them in 1B. And if one bean dies, I still have 50. I'm not paying any more costs. I'm just distributing my stuff within the region. Zone resilient, not region resilient. There was an outage was a week ago, two weeks ago now. Three. Last week. It was only in one region. Turns out, pretty important region. <laughs> <laughs> the US East is kind of the cheapest region and the default region that a lot of people use. Um, and if you had run your stuff out of both US East and US West, and had something pointing to both, you would have been fine. It was a region located. Turns out Amazon themselves ran their own status page off that one region and didn't make it redundant. <laughs> they have learned that lesson. Uh, one of the things I really like about them is the RCA on that. If you read it, you're just like, yup, a tech fat fingered it. <laughs> Typed in the wrong parameter, blew up the region. Turns out, and they, they list all these things reading through this stuff. I said, I've been at Detail for 12 years. I've been through some things, seen some things. Um, Reading through their list of things, they're like, yeah, I've done that. I've typed in the wrong parameters into a SQL query, pressed go, and then done like, oh no, what am I going <laughs> And luckily enough, I'm like a backup load, so then I just restore it. But like, they're right up there. See, they were so transparent. I got wrapped up there. Um, DR. If you're going region resilient, you're running your stuff in two places. You've got some meta ELB that's able to point, or you're using DNS probably to point between. And that's where you're willing to pay twice as much for a hot but what if you don't care that much, but you care more than zone? Well, one of the cool things for cloud is you can go in between. So you can have an ASG that's sitting at zero, zero. So uh, zero minimum, zero desire. And only in the event of an outage do you spin up those servers. So this sounds like I get complete DR for no additional carrying costs. And that's because I'm tricking you. Uh, remember I said the capacity guarantee thing, you probably don't care. There are times you care. The times you care is when you're trying to spin up your entire load in another region in five minutes, and you'll get a ice warning, but I don't remember what that stands for. Insufficient capacity exception or something. Um, Amazon will give you like an error when you try to spin up a T2 medium, and it says there is no, there are no more T2 mediums in US East 1A. Screw off. Uh, they don't say that last Need to work on their errors. Uh, so you have to decide how much you're willing to pay for it. The cool thing about the cloud is you don't, you're not defaulted to that, I'm just gonna have two sets of things here and there. There are a number of different layers, and different of our products do different of those things based on our contracts with our clients um, to figure out what we need to do for our team and RTL, which is, um, when you do disaster recovery in a contract, you often have a time I have to have your data from and time I have to get you back to operation. I never remember which is RTL or RPL, but one's one and one's the other. There are a lot of tricks there send backups to a different region, um, run across different availability zones. Some of those get particularly important when you do quirky things, like dedicated hosts. Dedicated hosts will hurt your DR and your redundancy if you're not clever about it. So be clever about it. Does that about answer kind of thing? Lily had a question. Um, just Hold the on. You need a microphone. So today you are mostly uh, focused on more traditional kind of architecture, right? So, but currently my question would be that I actually right now need to figure out what would the cost for a serverless architecture? Lambda. So, yeah, Lambda and DynamoDB and also the other, a lot, as you say, we don't read them, so we use, we start to use a lot of AWS uh, services like Kinesis and SNS, SQS. So, have you started, you know, having some kind of guidelines for those or? Yeah. Uh, so Lambda is super sexy. 
Um, Lambda's idea is it's serverless computing. It's not really serverless, it's just someone else's, else's servers. It's another layer of abstraction. So you can run Lambda in 100 millisecond chunks. So you give it various um, applets. It supports know, Python, Java, a couple. It supports some applets. And you pay per 100 milliseconds you use, which is really, really small when you're comparing to hourly or daily. Um, it's interesting, you have to code for it. So the reason I didn't deal with here is I was pretending you're not making any product yet. None of you have dev. You're just messing with hosting. Uh, if you can do Lambda, it's super efficient from a cost point of view. It's hard to compare. More often than not, you're starting fresh. When you start fresh in the cloud, you do things differently than when you're doing a lifting shift. Lifting from a host, traditional host environment then shifting to cloud technologies. Um, I'm gonna say my favorite phrase, because run numbers. You should be able to estimate what it's going to cost you to run and what the dev effort's going to be to convert. And then you're just making a trade. You're saying, what's my ROI? It's going to take me one year. I cost my developers at this much. So I'm going to add another year because I'm always wrong about my estimates. Um, one, of, one of my colleagues jokes that you should always double your number and increase your unit. So if someone tells you it'll take you two weeks, it's four months. You got it from somewhere. But it's a, it's, it's a clever way to kind of be better about your estimates. I do a lot of the budgeting now for, for architecture changes to take advantage of new cloud stuff. And we just added six months to everything anyone told us. And afterwards, some dev groups came to us like, oh, we're not going to be able to hit our targets. I'm like, oh, well, when are you going to hit it? And I'm like, we're going to be three months out. Like, well, I guess we can make that work in the budget. <laughs> 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 we even told them what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> but, but you want to run the numbers and figure out what's going to be worth. Um, some of the things are just, I'm going to save some money. So Lambda is, is an I'm going to save some money kind of stuff. Some of them are, I couldn't have done that without that tech. Kinesis is fascinating to me. The idea of, like, Kinesis handles um, event traffic, basically. It's a, it's a, they actually call it fire hose. It's, it's like a fire hose of events from one service to another in a cost-effective way. And that's a class of problems that before that was a thing, we would just not do that. Like, we're not going to solve problems in that way. So one of the things that cloud opens up is a, a classic build versus buy problem, right? If you build it, you get exactly what you want, but you pay for it, and like you, you did it. You get exactly what you want, but you get only what you made. If you buy it, you have to fit your needs to meet what somebody else's product is, but theoretically they keep working on it. Everybody else keeps releasing new things. Um, Athena is kind of cool. It's building around queries on S3. So many improvements with Aurora, which is their own proprietary database, is kind of cool. They redesigned the database. If you're a database geek, you probably want to read up on Aurora. Um, NoSQL, big, big data, those kind of spaces, cloud is kind of cool for. It's a very elastic problem. I want a thousand freaking servers, but for like an hour. And I want to run a Doom cluster, and I want to run a distributed compute problem, and then I want to stop paying for it all. Maybe it's still paying for storage. Um, so there are some cool tools there. I didn't address them here. Run the numbers. They, they do exist. Lambda in particular is, is really cool. Um, probably the future of, of IoT and Internet of Things, like any really small computing stuff. The idea of I'm going to send a job out and have it finish and then give me a result and only pay for my transactional time is pretty cool. You're getting the curves to be even closer. Other questions? In the back. Um, uh, what have your experience been with uh, SQL in the cloud? Do you run it in VMs? Do you saw it on prem? Bring your own <coughs> license? Uh, dedicated hosts. Um, SQL, especially if you use enterprise, which we do, is just ridiculously expensive. Um, and the license we get from Microsoft is better than what you would get publicly. But as I showed, even the public values are better than what you'll get paying Amazon to pay Microsoft. Um, the exception to that is you need to be big enough to afford your own DBAs. So when you self-roll, you have to manage it yourself. Their, Amazon has tiers, so you can just get an instance of a SQL Enterprise on it or SQL Standard on it, you're paying them for the license. Or you can get with RDS, uh, Relational Database Services, where they do some of the management, so you're not like setting up the drives and setting up where files are, but you're still doing your traditional database maintenance tasks. And then if you were to convert all the way to something like Aurora, 
they'll do all of that for you, but you can't do it. Uh, so if you are not converting your database system, which turns out is hard if you have anything there, uh, you probably want to run dedicated hosts if you're big enough to have your own people monitoring and managing your databases. If you're not, look at RDS. Um, and yeah, BYOL with dedicated hosts. It's, the savings is insane. The Tesla meter went up a lot that day uh, when we did that. You just have to recognize the limitations. So I'm locking, I'm running in a very specific place. When you reserve it, when you reserve a normal instance, for example, um, you buy like however many reservations, and then you don't actually have to pick where the coupon gets applied. It'll just automatically do that. Great. When you reserve a dedicated host, like that's weird. So you have to go and pick. I am assigning my reservation to this host. And if you spin up a new host and get rid of your old host and forget to move your reservation, congratulations, you're paying for two times the stuff. Not that that's happened. Uh, that would be about very quickly. So yeah, SQL, all the things I said about Windows and much more, because it's so expensive. Up here, we have a I'm enjoying turning my boss's boss into <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my, question, uh, my question is regarding the marketplace that yeah. we talked about in the presentation. So uh, it's like if you want to sell our, our uh, service space, uh, like our space to some other companies. So like, yeah, is it the same price or we can check up the price? Or there, how, how are the costs managed? Uh, there are two different marketplaces. There are three different marketplaces. Well, they should stop naming the marketplace. Um, the one I think you're talking about is reserved instance marketplace. Yes. You can set a price. Um, it's not allowed to be above the price of the on-demand. Like, you can't really fool somebody. Uh, you set a price when you're trying to sell. And it does work. The, the economic analysis I linked to did a, a time breakdown of how many days does it take on average to sell a thing. And as long as you're in one of the common spaces, so an American region on Linux, on a normal size thing, it's about 30 days, I think, 17 to 30 days, you're going to sell it in. You're recouping some of the costs. The other advantage is, on the buyer side, right? I know I'm going to need this for three months. I don't want to lock in for a year. I want to lock in for three months. So there are times where you really want that sublet, right? I only need the apartment for four months. I don't want to buy for a year. There's that advantage there. But you do get to stay on price. There's an API for it. You can also do it through the UI on the front end when you're clicking on the buttons and setting all the things. Just be very, very careful about it. It's, it's very, very specific. Reserve instances are super specific. It is a region, it is a availability zone, it is a type, it is a tenancy. I never actually talked about the tenancy. Um, dedicated host is one form of tenancy, so it's how granular is the thing I have. This is very, very important <coughs> uh, security stuff or healthcare, uh, insurance, financial stuff like that. Less important in our world. Um, still important, we respect privacy and all that stuff. It's just the regulations that apply to us are different from the regulations that apply to your doctor. That's why tenancy is a thing as well. If you can right. get a dedicated tenancy at a higher level than the host, you can get a dedicated instance. I didn't talk about that at all. If it matters to you, hopefully you already have someone on staff who cares about legal regulations. And it's making sure you don't break laws. Um, so yeah, you specify what things. Uh, can I have one sure. question? <laughs> uh, so uh, I understand that D2L is a global company, yeah? Yeah. So you, uh, and just uh, out of curiosity, do you have a situation of uh, a cloud failure in a specific region and how big it was and uh, if uh, your uh, architecture was able to survive? Sure. Uh, so one caution, uh, remember I talked about regulations? Turns out a lot of clients, including education customers, have specific desires about which countries their data sits in. Some regions care a lot more than other regions. I find that like Singapore feels really strongly about their data staying in Singapore. Um, in the US, depends. Like we have more than just educational institutions, and they say, yeah, our data stays in Canada, or in, in the States, or Canadian say our data stays in Canada. So our failover opportunities are constricted by data residency contracts, and we take that very, very seriously. Um, don't don't violate contracts. Feels like a good life lesson. Um, so we can't fail over. If you're in AWS Montreal and there's an outage in AWS Montreal, that's the only Canadian region right now. There isn't another Canadian region. So if you're all Canada, we don't have to fail. Uh, I'll give one each. Um, case where we were screwed, the S3 outage. 
we don't have a lot of SK usage, we have a dependency chain problem. So understand when you have a service, depends on the service, depends on the service. It's a funny story of somebody pulling over a censorship battle, um, some little unit that was used in a thing, that was used in a thing, that was used in freaking everything. And everyone's builds broke that day when someone pulled, what was it, left pad. The entire applet added four spaces to the left of things. That was all it did. It broke everyone's builds that day. Um, understand your pen chain. When S3 went down, we don't heavily use it, but it's the back end for one of our things that makes performance better. So it stopped making performance better. And it was interesting because like it failed in you know one percent of the cases because it was cache. It was behind CloudFront, which is a global caching scheme. It's getting your, your statics closer to you. Um, it was cached, it didn't encounter it, so like which coins were affected depended on all sorts of things. But we could have been resilient to that if we had, had put put it behind an EOB, put it behind a load bouncer, put it in multiple regions. The amount of storage we actually had is like two dollars a storage a month. We could have been resilient to that. Should we have been? Ah, it, it depends on how you do that risk mitigation. How much are we willing to invest to save one? There's always a way to do it. You have to. It's a zero sum game, though. So you have to decide where you're spending your money. We could have been resilient against that. We were totally just as as out as if we had been running on one server and somebody unplugged it um, for that part of the problem. A case where we were fine. Um, it actually happens all the time. The 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 zones go down. Like you'll have cases where US East 1A is experiencing, the Twitter feed is hilarious for this. US East 1A is experiencing increasing rates in failures to launch instances. Like, okay, what does that mean? You go and you're like, let's try it. Launch, failure, launch, failure, launch, failure. I see how 100% is bigger than 0%. <laughs> I see how that works there. Um, actually, they're pretty good about updating the thing, but they do it manually. So, there are a lot of loop, hoops they have to jump through before they'll update their status page, monitor or something. Um, so we see outages in zones a lot, outages, and we're resilient against that. Again, remember I talked about uh, your default DR. So for everyone, we go zone resilient. So we're not going to put all our servers in one A. We're going to put some in one B, some in one C. The US East goes up to one E, but they want to reduce that. Um, so when we lose a zone, mostly it becomes a capacity issue rather than, which is a performance degradation issue rather than an outage. And then we spin up more. Like, oh, we just lost half our servers. That's bad. Let's spin up more servers. Um, and if you have auto scaling groups, you can make that happen automatically. So we've been resilient against zone problems. We haven't been resilient against region problems. And that's for the clients that aren't going to pay us for, for a DR. There's a different expectation in it and a different reality. Understand what your expectations are, especially what your client expectations are. And exceed them, but decide by how much. That's the best advice I can give on that. Ah, yeah, burn for get taking weight back. <laughs> so uh, since we are talking about the risk mitigations and risks, uh, definitely uh, during that we dis uh, discuss about how we're gonna back up our systems and like you know in the cloud. So how does that adds to the cost of like you know existing cost? Totally does. Uh, remember, I said I'm not going to deal with EBS because it's too cheap for me to care about. It's four cents or four bucks a month because it's ten cents a gig. If I use S3, the difference there is EBS is a block store, so I can carve out forty gigs, pay for it, and attach it to a server, and I've got forty gigs of disk. S3 is an object store, so I don't have disk. I've got a bucket of files I can reference in weird URL ways. Um, it's a lot cheaper. So I'm paying, I think, about three cents a gig instead of 10 cents a gig. But I'm also paying for the number of times, one rate for the number of times I change a file and a different rate for the number of times I get a file, but they're low numbers. We take backups and toss them in S3 because once I put it there, like I might access it twice, but I'm not gonna access it two million times. So my rates end up working out. That can be pretty useful. And that's a case where you wanna find the service that's right for you. AWS has three different layers of file stores. So they have EFS, which is the most expensive, which is like your NAS equivalent. So I want to just reference things by files. It's three times, four times more expensive than EBS. EBS is your traditional, I want to attach a file system to a server. And then S3 is I just have objects. And even within S3, you can drop from standard, which is three cents, to infrequent usage, 
you pay half as much for the storage and twice as much for the access to Glacier, which is you pay some, I don't even remember, some stupid small amount for storage, but it's like a four hour wait if you want to access that file. So that doesn't work for some things. If, you, if, you're, if your return to operations is dependent on that four hour wait, don't put things in Glacier. If you're archiving financial records because you're required to hold them for seven years or longer if you're not a person, um, follow your own regulations. Don't listen to me for the kind of regulations. Um, it's pretty good. So yeah, it's tossing back up to cheaper storage costs, right. but with more expensive access makes a lot of sense. And we do that all over the place. The other thing you can do, make sure you're still in compliance with any residency issues, is toss them to different regions. Right. Um, one note about the S3 outage that happened recently, all the data was fine. So AWS has, what do they claim, 11 nines or something of durability, which means we've still got your data. They're only claiming four nines of availability, which is you can get your data. Turns out both are important. If you can't access your data, the fact they still have it is comforting but not helpful. Um, but once they've got 11 nines of we've got your data, where do you toss that? Maybe I make sure I toss it to a different region because if my problem is I've lost my region and I want to rebuild it, I want to rebuild it somewhere else. Things like that. The AWS is structured in, a, in an interesting organizational way. Like their teams are very independent and they have a rule set that says they have to be able to lose an entire region and the worst possible server you could lose in another region. And they test it. This is, if you're doing anything, test it. Um, a friend of mine used to work on the catalog team. That's when you type in something in Amazon, whether you get products back. Turns out that's important for their market and their business. Um, they walk into facilities and turn the power off. <coughs> How many people think their product could survive someone walking into the worst facility you have for you and turning off the power. <laughs> yeah. They're fanatic about their business, and their business is basically being a service host. You can use them as a platform host, but you're going to pay for them. But that's their business. So they do redundancy really well. Um, toss backups to one of their other systems. Don't, don't just run additional servers. Don't leave stuff on EBS. Um, for SQL or databases, don't leave stuff on server. You're going to pay a lot of money. I said 10 cents a gig. It's more if you want better IOPS. Uh, you can either pay 10 cents, which is general provision, which means you'll get, divide your size of your disk by three, and that's how many IOPS you get. So like three terabytes, you're getting 1,000 IOPS to a max. You can also pay for provisioned IOPS. So provisioned, in US East, you're paying, I'm never testing my number recall. Uh, instead of 10 cents, it's like 12 and a half cents per gig, but also point some number of zero, six, five cents per IOPS. So you can guarantee yourself like 20,000 IOPS on a tiny disk because it's your database and it turns out databases write a lot and read a lot. Um, you don't want to use that really expensive disk to store your backup. You want to use the ephemeral disk that came with the server and then toss it past it. And that's what we do. Got it. What else you got? I'll go ahead. We got another 30 minutes before we kicked out. <laughs> I'm Family. At least one of my kids is probably asleep by now. <laughs> Alright, we can just mingle and eat food and drink beer and stuff. You can ask me more questions, I'll be around for about 30 minutes until I also go home. <laughs>